Okay, so I think we will start. And we just have a little introduction from, uh, from PJ, who will uh, remind all of us and also the people that are actually watching us on uh, Facebook, what is Winnie, what we're doing here. And then we will continue by singing the Croppy Boy, which is a song that is in a, in a chapter that you already read, which is Sirens. And um, PJ. Okay, well, you're all very welcome. And of course, uh, we're doing this from Sweeney, the epic Sweeney in the Lincoln Place, number one. We're here since 1847. And of course, it's a very old uh, chemist. Uh, and uh, it has stayed more or less the same uh, since then and now. And it's one of the few places remaining that looks exactly the same. It's early Victorian. And of course, in um, uh, 1904, on the 15th of June, Joyce made us famous by putting us into chapter five uh, when Leopold Bloom comes in here to buy face cream for his lovely wife, Molly. And uh, then, of course, forgets the prescription. So the chemist has to look it up in his prescription book. And whilst the chemist is doing that, uh, he sees lemon soap, buys a bar of lemon soap for himself. Uh, so we've sustained ourselves since uh, for almost 11 years now because we've been running it on a voluntary basis by selling lemon soap and different books and uh, different things and even t-shirts. But uh, one of the most important things about here is when you come in, there's an amazing atmosphere. It's like stepping back in time and uh, it's run completely by volunteers. Nobody gets paid. So we have people from all over the world who come here, many from Italy because um, uh, all of you, uh, most Italians have read Ulysses, uh, um, not even Ulysses, but they start with Dubliner. So they know exactly Evelyn, one of their short stories and they have wonderful teachers and some of you are with us this evening and it's wonderful to have you and many of you have been here in Dublin so you know exactly uh, where to find us and you've been here many times and um, however uh, Joyce was a tenor as well as being a writer and had he not been a writer he may have been a tenor um, and a singer so and uh, he has many many songs uh, throughout um, all of his works. And uh, the one I'm going to sing for you this evening is called The Croppy Boy. And it's about a young uh, guy who is, um, he's the last of his family. His brothers have been killed. His father has been killed. His mother has died. So he goes to confession because he's a Catholic. And the Croppy Boy, uh, he, they were called Croppy Boys because they used the sheep shears for, for uh, cutting the, the wool of sheep to cut their hair. And they were cut, it was cut very short. So um, this young man, uh, he goes to confession, uh, not realizing that the priest is no longer there, but it's a yeoman captain. And of course, he finds out to his chagrin at the end that this is what's happened. So it's a very uh, short song. And of course, you all know it, and especially Enrico, uh, who has written and translated it as well. So, and he's done a wonderful job. So. Men are true in this house who dwell. To a stranger, Buchel, I pray thee tell. Is the priest at home, or may he be seen? I would speak a word with his father green. Are the priests at home and he may be seen? Sure tis easy speaking with Father Green. Ah, but you must wait till I go and see if the Holy Father alone may be. The youth has entered an empty hall for a lonely sound his footstep fall. In an empty chamber, all chill and bare, was a vested priest in a lowly chair. The youth has knelt to tell his sins. In omni day, the youth begins. At may a culprit, he strikes his breast. And in murmured tones, he speaks the rest. I cursed three times last Easter day, and once at mass time I went to play. And I passed the churchyard one day in haste, and forgot to pray for my mother's rest. 
At the siege of Ross did my father fall, and at Gory my loving brothers all. I alone am left of my name and race, and I go to Wexford to take their place. I bear no hate against living things, but I love my country above that king. So, Father, bless me and let me go to die if God has ordained it so. The priest said not, but a rustling noise made the youth look up in wild surprise. Other robes were off and in scarlet there was a yeoman captain with a fiery glare. With a fiery glare and with fury hoarse, instead of a blessing, he uttered a curse. It was good of you, boy, to come here to shrive. For one short hour is your time alive. Up on yon river three tenders float, The priest's in one, if he isn't shot. <coughs> and I hold his house for my lord the king, And the men, I say, may all traitors swing. At Geneva barracks that the young man died, and at passion his body lies. All you good people who like peace and joy, stop and shed a tear for the crappy boy. Yeah. Bravo. Bravo. Bravissimo. Yeah. The man, O oh muse, informed that many a way wound with his wisdom to his wished stay, that wandered wondrous far when he, the town of sacred Troy, had sacked and shivered down. The cities of a world of nations, with all their manners, minds, and fashions he saw and knew. At sea felt many woes, much care sustained to save from overthrows himself and friends in their retreat from home. But so their fates he could not overcome, though much he thirsted it. O men unwise, they perished by their own impieties, that in their hungers rapine would not shun the oxen of the lofty going sun, who therefore from their eyes the day bereft of safe return. These acts in some part left, tell us as others, deified seed of Jove. L'uomo dai molti percorsi, o Musa, tu cantami. Colui che molto vagò dopo aver abbattuto la rocca sacra di Troia, di molti uomini vide le città, scrutò la mente e molti dolori sul mare patì nel suo cuore per guadagnare a sé la vita, il ritorno ai compagni. Ma neppure così li salvò per quanto lottasse. Si rovinarono gli stolti per la propria cecità, cibandosi delle vacche del sole di Perione, che strappò loro il dì del ritorno. Di tali eventi, da un punto qualsiasi, racconta anche a noi, Odea, figlia di Zeus. So what we have just finished to read are the first verses from the Odyssey. And it's Homer himself that is actually making an invocation to the Muses to help him to write about the history of Odysseus or Ulysses. So today it's a very special day. We have a special guest, which has been a little bit of our muse during those many, many days in which we have read from uh, his own translation. So I think we need to make an invocation for him. And if we make an invocation for him as well, he will appear. So let's, we discussed about that, you know, during our reading. So let's make it like we are in, uh, yeah, maybe the 16th of June, 1904. We are in Dublin. We are somewhere and we are together with the guys of the Theosophical. And let's say that in one corner we can see WB Yates. On the other corner we can see G.W. Russell, most of all, A.E., the person that really inspired Joyce in many, many, many ways. And let's try to 
do like maybe Madame Blavatsky would have done. Let's try to call him, okay? And let's try to call him in Italian, okay? Let's try to say Enrico, se ci sei, daci un segno. Open all your microphone and let's call him, okay? Enrico. 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 And I shall warn you, there is a little dog here called Gary Owen who's barking all the time. So you will, uh, you will listen to you today, tonight. That's okay, oh. Enrico, welcome. I'm just trying to... Uh, let me see if I can do something. I'm going to show you the dog first. Ah, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are in the stereo room. She's still not mine. Hello. <laughs> We're having a couple of beers. Okay, so Enrico, Hi. thank you so much for being with us. It's absolutely fantastic. And so we have tried, you know, to 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 make this uh, this invocation, and you you arrived. And uh, <laughs> so the occult in Joyce, if I remember correctly, in 2007, you brought a book which is called Occult Joyce: The Eden in Ulysses. So how much there is of a cult in Joyce and uh, were we actually correct to do this, you know, being with Yates and, and, uh, and George W. Russell, I mean, what's what Joyce to do? I would say what's not a cult in Joyce. Uh, Joyce is, a, is an obscure writer, first of all. And the word occult comes from Latin occultum, which means hidden. So basically my take on this subject is the idea that whenever we speak about the occult, we are talking about some sort of obscurantism but that doesn't mean uh, that uh, it's that doesn't mean reactionary sometimes obscurantism can be productive the way i put it in my book is that we uh, we are used as literary critics to uh, to talk about um, um, revealing you know studying in order to reveal whereas literature sometimes instead of revealing reveals it reveals it it puts another veil enjoy that's what mm -hmm. joyce does all the time in order to, uh, to seek revelation, he, uh, he puts in place uh, a, a, a technique of revealing, crea creating new veils for, uh, for us. Um, and then he was also very much into, into the occult, into, the, into Neoplatonism uh, when he was very young. He was going to the meetings with, with Russell for, for a few months. And then he kept this interest because, I mean, we, when he was in Paris, he still kept he kept buying books of, of the occult. He had a copy of the occult review where the psychic uh, conversations with Oscar Wilde were first published. And uh, Finnegan's Wake is incredibly occult. So Enrico, all this occult and all these symbols and, and, and all these codes, as you said, we found them in all those masterpieces of, of Joyce. So here we come to, you know, the main focus of, of discussing with you today, to the, which is translating choice. So what does it really mean translating choice where we have a man that works so much, we you know, with symbols, with codes, with numbers as well. I mean, we have also, you know, talk about this. So translating choice is translating codes or translating words. And can we maybe use an example in here, you know, the very first word of Ulysses and the way in which you translate it and why? Um, I did it by mistake, really. I, mean, I wasn't supposed to. Uh, I, I, was, I was in America by then. I, I think it was, this was 2000, 2008. And I was in Indiana doing some research. And I received a, a, an email saying, dear professor, do you want to translate Ulysses? And I thought that this was a joke, like some friends of mine was pulling my leg. Um, and then I realized that it wasn't a joke. What this publisher had done, uh, they, they were looking for some young translator so that they could be paid less. And, and this translator <laughs> sh should be somebody that had done some Irish stuff before. And I had translated Brendan Behan, and I had translated uh, Mannix Flynn, uh, books by Irish writers. So basically they wanted to combine the two things, uh, youth uh, and, and the expertise in Irish stuff, because Previous translations of, of Ulysses and of Joyce were mostly done by English studies scholars. 
who would miss a lot of the, of the Dublinese, of the Irish stuff. So basically that's what they wanted to do. And when I realized that this was the case, I accepted. And I said, of course, I can translate Ulysses. Oh, uh, uh, how much for, <laughs> how much are you gonna pay me? And they said, uh, of course, peanuts. So basically I had to negotiate for, for, for months in order to, to be paid uh, you know, in a fair way. And in the end, they, you know, they realized that it was either you know, my way or not. So I did it. So it was basically by mistake. And, and uh, Enrico, this, this, this first word, when you start, you know, stately, that's how it starts, Ulysses, you know, stately. You know, when we are on, on, on the top of, of... It's the first mistake. It's the first mistake. Alex, what, Alex, was the first mistake. So you translated that as statuario. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about stately and, and the word stately and then your yeah, mistake it's, it's and all those strange. codes that we have? It was a very difficult choice. Uh, sometimes with translation, you have to accept that translation means change, first of all. I, I always remind my students of what uh, Shakespeare uh, said in As You Like It, where he has the clown Touchstone saying to William, who is in love with Audrey, and Audrey is uh, also Touchstone is in love with Audrey, and Touchstone says to, to William, I will translate thy life into death, which means I will change I, your life into death. So the verb to translate in the English, in the history of the English language meant change, utter change. And uh, literary translation implies that. Now, when you have stately there, of course, stately means solemn and something like that. In fact, the, uh, the previous translation had uh, the, the word that they, they choose was solemn, solemn, solemn. But the point of that beginning is that stately is also Stephen, and that stately is also Oliver Saint John, Saint John Gogarty, S T. And then, if you look at the end of that first sentence, you have the word crossed. So basically the first sentence of Ulysses begins with state and cross, with the state and the church. That, that's why I had to choose an Italian adjective, which means something like solemn, but it also means stately, of course, because the book had to begin with a combination of Stephen and Saint Stephen, proto-martyr, and Oliver Saint John Gogarty, and it had to begin with the state and to end with the church. That, that's the only explanation I can give to, to the many people that uh, told me that, uh, that my English is very poor because I decided to go for statuario, you know? That's, that's, that's great, Enrico. Thank you very much. And then can, can you tell us a little bit about maybe some other codes that we have inside, inside, inside Ulysses? Like I was reading something about, you know, Buck Mullingham and, and the initials BM. I mean, what, what that means? Um, sorry, I didn't hear you. I said I was reading something about you know Buck Mullingans and and the the initials B M. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, if you if you get, if you take the, the the very beginning of Ulysses, you have all the characters there: Stately, Stephen, Plum, Poldy, right? Buck Mulligan, B M, which means of course Buck Mulligan, but also Bloom, B M, beginning and, in, and ending, but also Bloom, Molly Bloom, reversed. It also means the Black Mass because you have a sort of parody of the mass soon after. And then in 15 episodes, you have actually the black mass performed by Malagi Mulligan. But you also have something which I just discovered. The initials BM for Joyce were very important, not only because they, may, they, they mean in English Bachelor of Medicine, which is what Gogarty was and what Joyce would have been if he had pursued this medical career, but it's also the, the, the initials, they are also the initials of the poor guy that died for love, uh, for Nora's love, Michael Bodkin, MB. So this book shouldn't be read uh, only on the level of words and the syntax and the sentences, but also uh, from initials. At the end of the day, if you look at Finnegan's Wake, initials are very important there, but also in Ulysses, in third episode, you have Stephen who wants to write uh, books with with uh, with letter letters for titles. So Joyce was very much into this type of uh, type of occult uh, signification. Yeah, and, and and there is another example that you know I, I like to 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 make in here, and it is something that actually you talk about it, but I was so fascinated about it. You know, we say word, 
and we can say world. So, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, it's not my first language English, but maybe Jack, when we say word and world, can you, can you pronounce word? Word and then world with an L. Oh, world. It's actually an interesting thing about world peace. It's yeah. mistranslated. Yeah. So there is, there is only one letter of difference, which is L, which is also the initial for uh, letter. So word and word. And, and there is this in, in, in Ulysses as well. Can, can, can you remind us when, when that happened? When, when... I would say that we, 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 we do see that, in, 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 of course, in, in Ulysses with the, with the misspelling, uh, Martha Clifford's misspelling. Uh, the other world, the other world. But we also see it in Finnegan's Wake where we have a, a remake of the beginning of John. Uh, in the beginning was the word, was the word. We have there in the bug inning was the void, W-O-I-D, which is very strange. I don't, know how, I don't even know how to pronounce, but what just wanted to say is that the very beginning, which is before the word, there was the void. And this void was a bug. It was a virus, the virus of language, the language that some people have uh, challenged, uh, the Irish language that disappeared, or any language that is suppressed. So basically, jo what Joyce wanted to do is to fill that void, which, by the way, in Kabbalistic sources, is also another, another shape for God. Thank you, Gary Owen. I have a dog here. <laughs> Which is the opposite of God, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Enrico. So, Enrico, you have, you have previously, previously mentioned the fact that, you know, uh, what you explain to your students. <clears throat> and I have to say that we have been very, very lucky because one of your students has been, you know, with us so far and will be with us until the end of, 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 of reading Ulysses from your, your translation, which is Fabiana. So can I say, you know, caramba, que sorpresa. So we are <laughs> meeting Fabiana and oh. again. Oh. Hi, hi, everybody. Sorry, if it was, I was late. I had some problem connecting, but I did it. So hi. Fabi, you have mentioned, and, you know, Enrico many, many times during your, your wonderful yeah. interaction. So mm -hmm. if, if you have any questions for, uh, for Enrico that are... Yeah, I have many questions, but I will start with a question on translation. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did you approach the translation of the 11th chap chapter, Sirens? Because we all know that it, it's a very musical chapter. And as you said many times, uh, translating is also rewriting. So I was wondering, how did you approach this uh, rewriting of this chapter in a, in a completely different language from the sound point of view. Uh, that was one of the most difficult ones of yeah. Ulysses. I mean, the, the episode we're talking about is possibly the, the biggest challenge for a translator because Joyce really believed that he, that he was creating music with that. There are a couple of letters after, uh, after he had finished the, the episode in which he says that he cannot listen to music anymore. Like after after writing the sirens, he cannot listen to music anymore. So, from a translator's point of view, what you want to do is to create some sort of music. But to do this when you're translating from English into Italian, it's very difficult because English is a, a I mean the English language is full of very very short words with. But that can be pronounced with one, one stress, a couple of stresses. In Italian, everything becomes longer and longer. Uh, it's like our, our, our lunches, you know, like you, you lunch in Ireland and your lunch is like 15 minutes. Here it's like three hours. <laughs> uh, when you translate into Italian, it becomes, everything becomes so large. And so you have to create a different type of music. What I wanted to do, and I'm not a poet, and I, I, I do think that this, particular episode should be translated by poets, if not by musicians. What I wanted to do was to create something that sounded okay to me. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's, that it's musical. So I, I I'm not too satisfied by what I did. And in fact, I'm actually redoing it now for, for the centenary uh, edition. So I'm, and I'm doing a new translation. 
And the episode where I'm working more, that I'm changing more, is actually Sirens. Because I think I have a different ear now that I'm old and, and, and drunker than then. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I was wondering because I can I can imagine it was very hard to translate music into languages with two different music. I also have a question about politics, actually, because uh, the chapter we are going to read, it's mostly about politics. So uh, reading it, I, I started to talk about, uh, started to think about one of the most important poets for Joyce, uh, our Dante, Dante Alighieri. And I was wondering um, about the influence of Dante on Joyce, because many critics say that if Dante had never uh, ban banished from Florence, so if he had never been put in exile, he would have never written his masterpiece because it was a very important point in his life. So I was wondering if we could say the same thing for Joyce, because of course he was in a, a self-imposed exile, which was different. But I, I strongly believe that it gave him a completely different point of view about Irishness and about his country in general and about politics on his country. What do you think about it? I think that you're right. I think that it's, this is the way it works for many people. When they are away from their own, from their own country, from their own land, they start uh, looking at it with, with stronger intensity. Um, it, it's pros probably, if I ask the, your, this question to you, I mean, how do you feel about it? You probably feel stronger than, than you felt when you were here. So exile, distance, detachment, estrangement creates this effect. Uh, I think that Joyce needed it, uh, not only because it was not too accepted. As I mean, after all, his fourth short story that was supposed to be published in the Irish Homestead was was uh, turned down, and uh, an essay, a great essay they wrote, that was turned down by by a journal. So not to make a lot of people felt threatened by Joyce back then, which doesn't mean that Ireland was as negative as is sometimes is sometimes depicted by. Uh, critics that write about, about Dubliners. Ireland was incredibly full of intellectuals. Uh, but Joyce needed that kind of distance, probably because of what we said before about the state and the church. He needed to be away from these two uh, dark powers. And he ended up in, in Trieste. He didn't end up in, in Italy. Trieste was Austria by then. When he actually uh, entered Italy and settled in Italy here in Rome, he stayed only for seven months and seven days because he was too close to the Vatican. And he, he knew that he had to go away. But you know what? This is another thing that we just discovered. We discovered that when, when he came over to Rome, he wrote about this in the Irish Times a few, a few months ago. When he, when he came uh, to Rome, the, the second uh, flat that he found for himself was a few meters from the last jail of Giordano Bruno. And uh, this is very significant because it reminded me of what happened to me actually when I, when I moved to Dublin. I, I moved to the north side of Dublin. I moved to close to the North Shakira Road because I wanted to be close to where Joyce had lived in the, in the hope that one could breathe the same uh, atmosphere. So Joyce did the same thing. When he was 24, he moved to Rome and he went to live uh, very close to where uh, Giordano Bruno, Giordano Bruno uh, breathed this last so, um, so yes, I don't know if I answered you, but I think that without exile, um, we wouldn't have, uh, Ulysses wouldn't be there. Yeah, 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 you answered me, thank you. And uh, one last question about um, Stephen Dedalus, actually, because we, Max and I, we had a discussion about who was the best, Stephen Dedalus or Bloom. And uh, sometimes I had the feeling I have the feeling that um, Joyce uh, feels contempt against uh, Stephen Dedalus. And um, I was wondering if he changed his mind about how he feels about Stephen Dedalus, because we know that he wrote many chapters with Stephen Dedalus and then they were published many years later. So 
do you think he changed his mind about the artists, the intellectuals, and how he feels about it? Or we we don't know actually if he changed his mind or not. Okay, we, okay, we, we don't know really. Mm, we, we, it's impossible to know really, but we can um, put forward our, our own hypothesis. And uh, a lot of scholars believe in this change from Daedalus to Bloom in Joyce's life. Uh, I'm one of the few really that believes that, that Joyce stayed Stephen Dedalus all his life. I don't, I don't think that he ever turned into Bloom. He never really became the great, the, the, the great person that Bloom is. He, he stayed Stephen Dedalus. And in fact, I was, last year I was uh, giving a course at uh, Notre Dame University with, uh, with Declan Kybert. And we were discussing this, you know, chapter by chapter, the book with, 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 with the kids there. And we, at least I, I, I think we, we, we came to the conclusion that probably after the third episode, after Proteus, whatever happens there happens in Stephen's mind. It's like the first three episodes are really what Joyce, you know, a, a sort of realistic depiction of, it, of his life. And then this visionary character, this invented, uh, perfect, ideal man kicks in in Joyce's mind. asked, for instance, by some guy, actually by Arthur Power, what happened between Bloom and Gertie in, in, in Nausicaa? And Joyce answered, nothing happened. It was always, everything was in the mind, which is really consistent with... We, we are use, we're losing you, Enrico. We lost you, Rico. The sound. Okay. Okay. Let's let let's wait for Rico uh, for Rico to come back. But while we wait for Rico, that hopefully hopefully we'll come back. Uh, I'm sure he will come back. So, but in the meantime, just for, for the non Italian speakers, the first word, statiaro, what does that mean? Uh, what does it translate as? <laughs> Statia, it's like statue. It means, uh, statua, like, like statuario, statuario. Statuario. Yeah. 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 It means uh, solemn, like a statue. Yeah. I yeah. think. Oh, okay. Yeah, what I was saying, you know, we would we would say statuesque in English, yeah. right? I think. So yeah, we've already been discussing that as to yeah, yeah. yeah. It can be related to solemn, but also to um, like a statue, um, someone who has limbs, like you know, as beautiful as statue, but and solemn. I think that it can be read both ways. Okay. Yeah, I think I think maestoso would be better, but but I, I understand what what uh, Enrico was saying in terms of the st, the state, yeah, and the church, and all interesting. that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But but it's an adverb. It it describes how he is walking. It doesn't describe him. It's not an adjective. Oh yeah. It's, can I it, can I can I just say something about this? Yeah. Actually, I, I put it in the footnotes there in Italian. If you say statuario with the comma afterwards that also means in a stately way like mm -hmm. i give you an example if i say uh, felice camminavo okay happy i walked that means happily i walked so basically in mm -hmm. italian if you put the adjective at the very beginning with a pause that is at the same time an adverb and an adjective mm. so that i don't know if it explains it to you but i i had explained it in the in the footnote mm -hmm. in the very lengthy and boring footnotes. <laughs> okay, Enrico, <clears throat> I just I just want to go back a little bit into the into the political message oh. and because uh, we have prepared a little things in here. So is there any real political message in Ulysses? Mm. 
I stand for the reform of municipal morals and the plain Ten Commandments, new worlds for old, union of all, Jew, Muslim and Gentile, three acres and a cow for all children of nature, saloon motor hearses, compulsory manual labor for all, all parks open to the public day and night, electric dish scrubbers, tuberculosis, lunacy and war and mendicancy must now cease. General amnesty, weekly carnival, sì, bonus, bonuses for all, Esperanto, the universal brotherhood, no more patriotism of bar spongers and dropsical imposters, free money, free love and a free late church in a free late state, mixed races and mixed marriage. Solo per riformare la morale cittadina e obbedisco ai dieci comandamenti così come sono. Mondi nuovi a rimpiazzare vecchi. L'unione di tutti, ebrei, musulmani e gentili. Tre acri e una mucca per ogni figlio della natura. Berline per carri funebri motorizzati. Lavoro manuale obbligatorio per tutti. Parchi pubblici aperti giorno e notte. Lavapiatti elettriche. Dovranno ora scomparire la tubercolosi, la pazzia, la guerra e la gente che chiede l'elemosina. Un'amnistia generale, carnevale ogni settimana, con licenza di maschera. Premi in denaro per tutti, esperanto, la fratellanza universale, mai più patriottismo da ubriaconi e impostori idropici, denaro libero, libero amore e una chiesa libera e laica in uno stato libero e laico, razze miste e matrimoni misti. So, this was the political statement made in a psychedelic state of consciousness by Leopold Bloom in Church, and we read from the original from, uh, from Joyce and then in translation from, uh, from Enrico. So is that really a political statement from Joyce, Enrico, or is it just a kind of delusional psychedelic state from Bloom and he was just talking because he was delusional? What can you tell us about that? I guess apart from the one cow for each citizen, <laughs> I'd actually be a great uh, political program. It's not exactly what our own politicians uh, propose, but I think they would be great. Yes, I do think, I mean, Leopold Bloom was an internationalist and in many ways a socialist. Joyce was so before, I mean, he proclaimed himself to be. So when he was in Trieste, the very, very couple of years, first couple of years in, in Austria and then in Rome, he described himself as as a socialist and an anarchist. And then in some way, for some reason, he decided not to call himself a socialist anymore. And he, and he proclaimed himself disillusioned with politics in general. And yet what he produced with Ulysses, but even more with Finnegan's Wake, is the most anti-fascist works ever written. Works uh, upon uh, which nobody can ever be the authoritative voice. Uh, even the greatest scholars uh, have to admit that the, uh, their own authority is provisional and transient. So this is the, the greatest political message of Joyce. I think that here, I mean, that what, you're, what, what, what you just read beautifully is uh, an example of how even through parody, we can achieve utopia. We can create our utopia through parody, through comedy. At the end of the day, uh, Dante's greatest work is not called the Divine Tragedy. It is the Divine Comedy. And uh, any, any emancipation comes from comedy and from laughter. And remember what Bobby Sands said, uh, what you read in the, uh, in the Morales in Belfast, uh, that our laughter, uh, our revenge will be the laughter of our children. Uh, in that sentence by poet Bobby Sands, we have also uh, an attempt to change the meaning of words because the word revenge gets translated into, into laughter. That's what great poets do. And that, that's what Joyce wanted to do. Hey, thank you, Rico. And, uh, you know, for us in Sweden, it's the message of universal brotherhood is it's extremely important. I mean, it's something that we really want to protect uh, as the main message of, of, of Joyce and one of the main message of Ulysses, but not only of Ulysses. I mean, it's of Finnegan's Wake as well. And, and this fantastic way of Joyce to put together different languages. I mean, think about, you know, the, the, the thunder words in Finnegan's Wake, you know, when we have 
you know, many languages put together, but all the feeling as well, and Ulysses as well. I mean, there is a great master of Italian, you know, and, and French languages there. Is the use of all so many different languages also a way for Joyce to give the message of universal brotherhood? I mean, in here, Bloom is talking about Esperanto. Is that what Joyce was somehow trying to do? Yes, I, I, I think you're right. Um, in Feeling As Way, we also have the word peace translated in so many different languages. Uh, but we also have sort of, as I said before, sort of uh, revenge, revenge turned into laughter. Like, I think that what Joyce wanted to do by having uh, the great uh, lingua franca, the great uh, global English colonized by minor languages was also an attack, uh, a, a, a laughing attack on the uh, on the hegemony of, of languages in the world. Joyce was able to use English and to colonize, but in a laughing way, by using so many minor, minor languages. Like Finnegan's Way begins with a word that is found in any dictionary, River Run, okay? This word is found in the Oxford English Dictionary. But of course, if an Italian reads it, becomes riverranno, which means they will come again, they will re-arrive, okay? Riveran. In, in French, uh, it can be the reverie, uh, the rêve. We have so many, we even have Triestine there, because in Triestine, the word rivera means to come again. So basically, right from the first word, Joyce uses a dictionary word from English, and, uh, and uh, and in, in the virus of language, the bug that we were talking about before changes and it makes into something different. This is the greatest example of linguistic emancipation that we ever had, uh, and which is parallel, by the way, to the political emancipation that he wanted to achieve with Dubliners. He wanted to open the eyes of his, of his people, right, in Dubliners. And in Finnegan's Wake, he's saying to all of us, Finnegan's, wake. You Finnegan's, do wake, wake up. Okay, so I think that this message is consistent right from the first word they wrote in the sisters, which is, by the way, upon awake, right till till the end of his of his of his writing. Fantastic, Enrico. Fantastic. River run, river run. No. And uh, you know, there's there's something else, and this is really the, you know that the last question, last thing I want to discuss with you before we open the question time with uh, with our readers, and and I'm sure there will be a, a few questions from our readers. And I, I got thirty percent battery, so <laughs> if I disappear, it's not. So, much <laughs> so we, we 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 will try to speed up. And uh, okay, so Enrico, uh, I think there was something that we have been able to do with our readings, both the readings in English and the readings in Italian, which is to make the work of Joyce more accessible to people and also give explanations, you know, to this work. It's been fundamental. And for this, you know, a great thanks goes, goes to Fabiana that makes the introductions for all our chapters. The last book that you have recently published is called Chi ha paura dei classici, who is afraid of the classics. So Enrico, who is afraid of the classics? Um, contemporary writers. Contemporary writers are afraid of the classics because they don't realize that what we call literature is a, is a provision of, I mean, it's, it's something that will, that will be lost very soon. No, Bob Dylan reminded us that Shakespeare would never have called himself a literary man, because literature, the, the meaning of literature in terms of fiction, it comes into the English language in the, in the 18th century, the end of the 17th century. Before that, nobody would use the word literature to mean fiction or drama or art. It would mean medicine, law, other things. Okay. So nowadays, we we, we fill our, our mouths with the word literature, but what we really mean is marked, uh, marketable books, books that that have that have the right credential to enter a, a, a market. And this all began with the with the novel. Okay, with the history of the English novel. The English novel it was not written because it was an artistic thing, but because it was very profitable uh, sort of uh, activity. Now, people like Joyce, uh, and if you think that Dubliner sold 250 copies in four years, people like Joyce were not after that type of success. 
they were riding in uh, beyond beyond the, the 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 prison wall of literature uh, as a market space uh, so what i when i wrote that book it's actually a very short pamphlet when i wrote that what i meant was that uh, in many ways uh, we today we nowadays mix the two things art and and literature there is a a very important reason why Joyce didn't uh, entitle this book uh, "Portrait um, Portrait of the Art of the Literary Man" as a young, man. you know, he, he chose the word artist. He didn't say writer. He didn't say literary man. Okay, no. so Joyce was after art, and after is beyond the prison walls of of literature. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree with, 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 with this line. Okay, guys, we're going to open the, the question time now before the, the iPad of Enrico <laughs> will be without, without charge. Okay, so we are very much disorganized, like usual, very chaotic in any way. Who wants to ask questions, just raise the end, but the real, the real end. Okay, just that's like that. Who wants? Ilaria, Adele, Billy. Okay. Uh, Ilaria, you want to go first? You're mute. Sorry about that. So I lost a second. Enrico, I have uh, a curiosity because uh, Fabiana was actually telling us that you encourage uh, to read Ulysses, not necessarily in a chronological order, and to enjoy bits and pieces, maybe skipping from one bit to another. So my curiosity was, um, did you translate Ulysses in a chronological order? And then I have another question, which is um, out of my curiosity, again, uh, in which language did you first read uh, Ulysses? Was it in Italian or in English? And if it was in Italian, did you have to shake off the first the rhythm of the first translation, like I did when I even read it in English. Um, okay, I start from the last question. I, I read it in Italian when I was a kid. I was was very young, and uh, the reason why I read it in Italian, the reason why I read it at all, was because my my friend Fabio Bedone, with whom I translated Finnegan's Wake, the last parts of Finnegan's Wake, uh, he had read the book when he was twelve. And he told me, listen, man, you, this is a book you have to read. And I, and I was 14, I read it in time, but it didn't really make too much of it. So it didn't stay within, within me because the language of that translation, that good, very good translation, it was a Florentine language of the 50s. So it was really not too um, appealing to a young, you know, a, a young guy of the, of the 90s. So I, I, really ne I never really felt attached to that. And then I, I read it in English when I was 18 or 19. And that was the reason why I came uh, to Ireland. I mean, that was one of the reasons why I, I moved to Ireland. The other reason would be the Guinness and, and girls. But uh, of course, uh, Ulysses was great. And then I met this great man, Declan Kybert, who uh, once in class explained to us that Ulysses is like a, a CD where you can move from track one to track four. If you don't like track two, you, you move to track three, and then you, maybe you will go back to track two when you start lagging the, the CD. So basically what I did was, I uh, started reading it in this way, and I loved it. When I had to translate it, I had to stay with, uh, with, the, with the chronology, because, I mean, it really helped, because a lot of the things that happen in episode nine are explained already in episode two, so you need to, you need to, to do this chronological thing. But as a, as a reader, I would encourage people to do one, four, two, five, three, six, so that the big obstacle produce is, you know, delayed. Mm -hmm. Okay, grazie Enrico. Uh, allora, ovviamente io mi sono già dimenticato chi vuole chiedere, fare, fare domande. Abbiate pazienza, ma siccome che sono ribambito. Eh, allora... Adele, you have, you have a question as well for, uh, for Enrico, is that correct? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, so Enrico, um, hello. Um, it was a pleasure uh, to start reading this uh, translation of uh, Joyce. 
And um, as I am a curious person, I looked for your name uh, in YouTube and I found uh, um, um, a lesson that you did together with Alessandro Bergonzoni and uh, your friend Fabio Pedone. It was about Finnegan's Wake. And I learned, I think that I didn't know about Joyce, that the daughter of Joyce, Lucia, uh, suffered for... And so probably Finnegan's Wake is uh, addressed uh, to her with this extreme use of language. Um, I also took some notes about words that were translated from English to Italian. For example, there was one that, that is very funny, is noisance, that comes from noise and nuisance, and it translated it cagnarogne. It is very, um, very funny, and I like it very much, your ability to play with uh, the language, with Italian and English. So my question is, uh, um, which is the, the thing that, if you can make some examples from uh, the translation of Ulysses, some words that were really, really difficult to, um, to give uh, in Italian, to give back in Italian. Ah, okay. Like the other day I was uh, re-translating the Cyclops, actually finished two days mm -hmm. ago. And there was, uh, you know, remember where we have, they're talking about Edward VII, and it, it's called the Peacemaker. And the citizen says uh, mo something like more, more, pox than, more pox than pox, more syphilis than peace, something like that. And in the previous translation, I had done something terrible. Uh, for many, many months, for many years, actually, I tried to come up with a new uh, uh, funny translation for Pax and Pox. And the other day, uh, I used the talks. word uh, peacemaker, which is paci pacificatore, and I went out, uh, più, più figa che pace. Pacificatore. <laughs> Picatore. <laughs> I think that, that works. Because this guy was, you know, was accused. He was thought to... to to have been uh, very fond of, uh, of that particular part of the, of the woman's body, and he, that he had mm -hmm. syphilis, so I went for the word figure, which means uh, the pussy. Okay, so yeah, okay. You, you do these things in translation. Sometimes when you can't, don't know what to do, you mm -hmm. have to invent. Uh, yes, translation is really invention. Phineas Lake gives you the opportunity to do that every other word. Ulysses is full of these things, but it's easier. Mm -hmm. And well, there is another word that is land shape that uh, you translated the uh, panombrama, land shape instead of <laughs> landscape. Yeah. Panom, panombrama is very, very um, beautiful. How you, you could uh, There's uh, one I translate. If any, anybody there knows uh, a bit of German, there is a nice, nice expression in Finnegan's Wake where instead of damn it, we have darm it. D A R M, okay, and dar means vowels basically, and uh, so you have to say, but at the same time, something connected with the vowels and with shit, and also damnation. And we came up with mm -hmm. uh, the Roman uh, regulation, budelacitua. Uh, budelacitua, <laughs> it's pretty funny too. But budel, yes, and the more uh, the Romans. It's really, yeah. Yes, of course. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Enrico. Ed è, è bellissimo questa cosa che hai detto, no? che è, bisogna, è, you, you need to create words. It's wonderful what you said you know, about creation, because art is creation most of all. So you are making of translation a form of art, and this is wonderful. Okay, now we have Sabrina from Trieste. Another question from Trieste. There we go, Sabrina. Enrico is all for Hi. you. Yes, um, now I'll try to explain myself now. Let's see if I can make it. Uh, in the moment, of Molu. Uh, of course, in the original, um, there is the lack of punctuation and a lack of many apostrophes, but not, I, I didn't have time to reread it, uh, you know, uh, to reread all of it, but maybe not so many um, grammar and spelling mistakes. Whereas in your translation, there are many, la uh, written, you know, uh, mm -hmm. instead of like the adverb, instead of, um, L apostrophe uh, and the verb, or, or others. And um, so uh, is this choice um, 
uh, motivated by the fact that, of course, you wanted to, I suppose, you wanted to represent the flow of the um, stream of consciousness to make it more clear. But at the same time, uh, is there the risk for Molly to look a little bit less educated that, or a little bit more uneducated that she was than she was? I don't know if I made myself clear. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that, that's a risk. I mean, she is not too educated and she, she does make a lot of mistakes right from, uh, from the fourth episode in Calypso when she, when she says, she says, he must have fell, okay? So she really begins her, her world. And, she, and the monologue there is full of mistakes, but it's also full of stuff that I wouldn't call mistakes. Like when she writes it without the apostrophe or uh, he, hid, okay? Head or hell, which is heel, apostrophe LL. -L. Um, so yes, that's a risk. And in fact, one of the first reviews of that uh, translation pointed that out. But I do think that at the same time, what I was doing was, uh, I was trying to, um, to reach a sort of middle way between um, oral, oral literature and experimentation. If you look at the way that uh, Italian writers like Palazzeschi or the Scapigliati wrote at the very beginning of the, of the, uh, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, they, they did use that kind of thing. L a with the stress instead of a l apostrophe h a and up till the 60s the, the 60s there were writers who would did that who would do that so what i was trying to do was being experimental and also popular because that kind of mistake is a mistake that my grandmother would make like mm -hmm. to write without the h's okay and a lot of kids yes, yes, up till yes. in elementary school do the mistake but uh, you're very oh, even right about the today. risk even older kids today, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you yeah, don't write about the risk, but I have, you know, translation is to take risks, and what I wanted to do was trying to avoid any sort of mental pauses, so no apostrophes. Like Joyce didn't use apostrophes, and uh, in order to do that, I also had to to uh, make away with the H's because an H, you know, let's say the word L apostrophe H. A, like la fatto. If you take the apostrophe away and you keep L H A, that becomes Portuguese. You know, it becomes different. So what I wanted to do was create something, you know. And let it flow more. And yeah, also let, let, let it flow. Yeah. So it flows. Yeah, it does of flow. Literacy, but also of experimentalism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rico. Uh, we just go ahead now with the last three questions and uh, because time is limited and most of all butter is limited. So uh, I think Owen, Bill and then Gabriella from uh, from Rende with a question in Italian. So Owen and then Bill and uh, and then Gabriella. So Owen, it's if you have your question. Outside of Sweeney's. <clears throat> yes, yes. Hi, hi yes. Enrico. Uh, just a quick question. Um, nothing to do with tra translation, just for myself. In the Cersei episode, uh, Stephen says, must get glasses, broke them yesterday. So has Stephen broken his glasses all the way through Ulysses' book? Is he without glasses all the way through the book? Uh, oh man, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, that makes me think of two things, but I don't have any, any answer for you. Would it be, am I, am I, am I asking you that? Would it be related to, to uh, the looking glass? I mean, the the idea that glass could also mean looking glass. Yeah, it's because it's written um, a little bit. It could mean two things. First of all, must get glasses. Broke them yesterday, so he broke them yesterday. But the next sentence is sixteen years ago, when he broke them in a portrait as well. Yeah, so you're talking about the glasses, you know, the glasses when he was a kid in Congo's. Okay, so you're, you're not aware that he has broken the glasses the, the day before on the 15th of June, no? Ah, hmm. oh, man, that's a question for, for Sam Sloat, Trinity College. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, Enrico. I'm sorry, about, I, but I will think about it. Um, Okay, thank you. That's, that's, an, inter that's an interesting one. Uh, we have also, uh, before we go to Bill, we have a question from... Uh, uh, 
from, from Facebook, from our live stream. So Federica Fagioli is actually asking about uh, Joyce and Gaelic, Joyce and the Irish language. Did you like the Irish language or, or not too much? What do you think, Enrico? Joyce, I, I think he was so very fond of, of, of the Irish language and critics are very dismissive of this. We should, I mean, the classes that he took, the Irish classes that he took at University College were given by a man called Patrick Pierce. Uh, for a few, you know, for a few days, he went to, to Patrick Pierce to learn Irish. And uh, critics are very dismissive of this because they say that he went there because he was in love with a girl. But then you, you do have this big presence, presence absence of Pierce and the rest of them in Ulysses and in Finnegan's Wake. You think of the Ballad of Thurs O'Reilly, right? That puts together Pierce and the O'Reilly. Or if you even think of the, the second episode of Ulysses where we have this very strange pun on uh, the Greek, uh, uh, um, Pyrrhus, right? Pyrrhus. Are we talking about, you know, Greek history or a recent Irish history? So I do think, I do think that Joyce was incredibly fond. I, I think that Finning, uh, Irish in Finnegan's Lake is the fifth uh, or sixth language in terms of frequency. So it's very used. Of course, he couldn't, he wasn't fluent, couldn't speak Irish fluently, but he was incredibly into it. And there's a number of scholars nowadays that are uh, advocating this. Uh, Bill? Uh, thank you. You know, I think I, think I need um, um, days and weeks with you with a lot of uh, Guinness and uh, and this is not going to do it. So I, I'm, I'm very, I'm not going to waste your time. I would point out that BM in American English is a very common way of saying bowel movement also. I, I had a BM, which fits in very, very well with Leopold and, and other things in the story. But that's something else. One of my, I haven't finished reading your translation. I know in that when, when you're, translating, usually you look for a work in your own language that is comparable, so your readers will have something to attach to. In this case, there's nothing like Joyce in any other language, you ha so you have to create it yourself. But I was curious about why O'Connell Bridge and why not Ponte O'Connell? Why Mr. Bloom and why not Signor Bloom? Just simple choices like that. Yeah. I, I... Okay. Uh, from from a theoretical point of view, there are cri critics that uh, advocate that, that there's a number of people that prefer um, what we called foreignizing translations, and other critics that uh, prefer domest domesticating translations. Mm -hmm. I'm one that likes to foreignize. I, I do prefer my readers to uh, be plunged into a Dublin scene rather than an Italianized scene. That's why I kind of keep all of these uh, markers. So I prefer to say Mr. Bloom rather than Signor Bloom because Signor Bloom to me would seem too, too Italianate. Italian. But, I would, but a, a lot of other translators uh, go for different options. But there's also a political question there. Because for instance, when you're talking about place names, there are some place names that do get translated. For instance, the, our city Firenze. Firenze becomes Florence, right? Uh, Roma becomes Rome in English. If you look at the English language, London becomes Londra. Why, why is it that Cardiff stays Cardiff? Dublin becomes Dublino. Edinburgh becomes Edinburgh. Why Glasgow stays Glasgow? So I think but there is a question of a hegemony of the land, of, of geographical hegemony. Mm. The, the biggest, you know, the biggest places, the biggest uh, towns, cities, they are allowed a translation, whereas the periphery is not. And I do think that Joyce was a man who made a periphery into a center. Dublin became the center of our, our universe in many ways. So I, that's why I need to keep all of those Dublin markers and avoid translating them. But in, in, in that regard though, in terms of, uh, of a, a domestic translation or an, a, a an international translation, I would have preferred you to keep the English songs 
in English. Yeah. I mean, in, and that's in, what I'm doing now. We have we have Lachi Darem Lamano in yeah, Italian, but all of the other word, all the other songs are in English, and and it's troubling when they're translated. I know, I, I know. That's you're you're totally right. That's what I said. I was I was very young when I did that in my new translation. That's what I'm doing. I'm keeping all the English uh, songs. That's I, what spend, I would like to spend hours with you talking about the first three chapters and the rest of the book because uh, that's my oh. my view is that. The first three chapters are a continuation of Portrait of the Artist, and they are Joyce's writing about Stephen. And the whole rest of the book is Stephen writing about Stephen. It is, it's, it's all filtered through Stephen. Everything that happened to him in the first three chapters, yeah. he turns into art. He makes a story. He, he tells a story. That's exactly what I was saying before. Yes, I do. Yeah, exactly. I do you, exactly. Right? Exactly. So, okay, Let's Bill, I really, I, I really hope you know that this nightmare of, of, of this terrible virus will finish soon and we can meet, you know, all of us here in Dublin and having some nice Guinnesses all together and drink and discuss a lot about that because it will be absolutely wonderful. And uh, I think there is, um, Gabriella, are you online? Gabriella, she say? So, Gabriella, una domanda per te in italiano. Gabriella, ti prova a parlare. La sento molto bene. Gabri, non ti sentiamo? Ok, probabilmente non ci sente, ma la connessione... Andrea, you want to ask a question to... Uh... Come here. Non ci sente, mi sa, dai. No, ma passiamo ad Andrea, che ha anche lui una domanda per te. Hi, Enrico. Nice to meet you. Uh, I have a question about the uh, politics passages we read before. Uh, this passage reminds me some words of, uh, of Nietzsche's, of Nietzsche. And uh, I want to know if uh, um, Joyce and Nietzsche know each other and or uh, uh, Joyce uh, read uh, the Nietzsche's war. Cut. Sorry. Yes, yes. Yes, he was very familiar with Nietzsche. Okay. Yeah, he was very familiar with Nietzsche. He wouldn't be, of course, a scholar, but he was, he was very, I mean, even you, you find Nietzsche also in a painful case in Dubliners. So, and then also, I mean, the, the very first episode of Ulysses, you have the Ubermensch yeah. and, the, you know, of course, the Hyperborean. Yes, he was, I, I don't think that he, that he was in line with Nietzsche too much, but he was. Well, uh, with Nietzsche, there is a misunderstanding, I think. Because, uh, the Nietzsche we know, there is the Nietzsche filtered by his sister's work. Uh, I study a little bit of Nietzsche uh, during my uh, philosophy uh, studies in university, and we have uh, a total rework about Nietzsche. Basically, uh, it's uh, not the uh, Nazi view of the of course, of course. man, and there is a lot of globalization, a lot of uh, words about uh, division between states and church. Uh, and things like that. And uh, so I, and this passage in specifically reminds me that passage is the, in the Gaia Shens, I think, if I remember correctly. So thank you for your answer. I'm like 12%, so I think I, I'm, I'm just about to, to expire, virtually oh, oh. expire. How, how much do you have? 12%. 12, 12%, 12%. okay. 12%, so. yes. Of the beer, of the beer, yeah. <laughs> can, I say, can I say hello to? PJ, where's PJ? Is he? No, I'm here. PJ. Enrico. Is he in Kennedy? Are you not in Kennedy's, man? Yeah, uh, Kennedy's is closed until oh. the 10th oh, of August. Shit. Otherwise, uh, I'd be there and you'd be with me, right? <laughs> I was supposed to come. You know, I, look, like, I look forward to seeing you coming back here. And I loved the 16th of June when you came in from your translation with us here on Blue Day. It was absolutely we'll nice. Not to mention the pints we had afterwards, so. <laughs> We're gonna have a few more. <laughs> Many more, not just a few. <laughs> okay, Enrico, uh, io provo ancora a vedere se. Okay, forse abbiamo Gabriella. Ti mi sentite? Ah, finalmente. Okay, Gabri, dai. Allora, chiedi okay. la tua domanda a Enrico, che poi iniziamo con, con la nostra lettura. Perfetto. Allora, Enrico, ciao, buonasera. Io ti parlo in italiano, però a differenza Perfetto. degli altri. <laughs> Mi senti? Eh, sì, sì e no. Diciamo, sì. Ok. Ora? Meglio? Sì. 
Ok. Allora, ehm, io ti farò una domanda un po' diversa, nel senso, partiamo da un tuo uh, esimio predecessore, mi senti? Un sì. certo si signor Calvino, no? In cui eh, il suo saggio uh, ti diceva che in pratica tradurre è il vero modo alla fine di leggere un testo. E in pratica in questo saggio dice che eh, il passaggio poi alla fine tra un testo letterario, a parte il suo valore, qualunque sia il, il suo valore, e in un'altra un lingua ogni volta eh, richiede un, un qualche tipo di, di miracolo. Dice Metti il microfono vicino alla bocca, mi sa che non ti sentiamo. Ok, mi senti ora? Sì. Meglio Enrico? Ok. E, e quindi ti dicevo, lui parla di un miracolo di una traduzione, eh, di ogni volta che si fa la traduzione, di un miracolo, no? mm. Mm. di un qualsiasi testo letterario. Eh, tu pensi eh, di aver fatto ciò? Qual è la tua opinione in merito? Cioè la pensi come Calvino? Da, da ateo devo dirti. Sì. So. <ride> miracoli. Io ho creduto nei miracoli finché Totti giocava, finché Totti <ride> qui ne aveva fatti tantissimi miracoli. Tra l'altro è un grande traduttore. Presente in Finnegan's Wake, in molti ecco. modi, con la parola Totti, che in inglese significa ragazza. E, no, allora io sono convinto che Calvino avesse molte ragioni per dire questo, perché lui è stato anche un editor, oltre ad essere un grande scrittore, ha lavorato in casa editrice, e quindi ha... Sì, sì. Lui, è un libri. lui è un, tradu un traduttore. Sì, sì, esatto. certo, però ha anche commissionato libri, ha anche scelto traduttori, quindi ha scelto le persone giuste per le cose giuste, per cui... Eh, per esempio Maturin l'ha fatto tradurre in parte a una, a una traduttrice avvicinata da Manganelli, insomma era una persona molto seria. Secondo me c'è una verità di fondo in questo che dice, ovvero che la traduzione è transustanziazione. La parola è presa dalla teologia, ovvero dal fatto che il corpo di Cristo si trasustanzia e diventa un'altra sostanza. La traduzione è questa, è prendere un qualcosa che diventa un'altra cosa, diventa un'altra cosa. Ovviamente c'è un legame di filiazione, però c'è una sostanza diversa. E se questo è poi il miracolo laico, sono d'accordo. Ok. Ragazzi, Va bene. 4%, mi Enrico, <ride> no, Enrico, senti, noi, 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 noi possiamo solo che, che ringraziarti. Io ringrazio voi. Eh, veramente, noi ci stiamo divertendo tantissimo a leggere la tua traduzione. E grazie e mille una, una, un applauso a tutti quanti Enrico perché veramente ci ha fatto grande compagnia oggi 